Hi, everybody. I'm Melanie Marie Boyer, the Executive Director of the Pittsburgh Metropolitan Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Thanks for joining us on our Latino Pittsburgh Digital Speaker Series. Today, we're going to be speaking with our common guest, Dave Pinkowski from the FBA. He has been tremendous in bringing us these different workshops to help our small businesses and contractors connect with government contracts, get certified. And he's here again today. Welcome, Dave. Thank you, Melanie. Good morning, everybody. So uh, I guess it's noon, close enough, whatever. Uh, great to be <laughs> back again. Really excited to uh, be here today to talk to you guys about how to actually respond to a federal solicitation. So. Yeah, we've gone through the process of getting certified, you know, getting on those lists, getting your name in the room, and now we're going to figure out how to reply. So let's just jump right in. Okay, great. Thanks, Melody. Yeah, as, as you said, Melody, this is definitely where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. You know, now is the time that we actually figure out what to do with all those certifications and how do we actually respond to some of those federal solicitations that are out there. So this is always one of my favorite classes because uh, you can get all that certifications, you can get all the registrations, you can do all that great stuff, and it's very, very meaningful things. But at the end of the day, you're eventually going to have to bid if you want to win some of these government contracts. So this is always a pretty fun class. It's interesting to see and talk about, and a lot of clients really like it. Um, so just very, very briefly, you guys have heard my little spiel before about the SBA and who we are and what we do, but we are a federal agency. We've been around since 1953, and our mission and goal is to help small businesses grow, expand, and recover. And we do that in conjunction with our many excellent resource partners that I have listed there. And again, as usual, I do have all the links at the end for our small business development centers, SCORE chapters, women's business centers, and our other resources that help you. Um, you know, there's a lot of excellent small business sources, as Melanie knows, and many of you probably do, uh, that are available to assist, that offer free or, or low cost counseling assistance. And we can help you with all kinds of different things, no matter where you are in business. So that's uh, really what it's all about. And, um, you know, like Melanie said, we will go ahead and just jump right in. So today we're talking about federal proposal preparation. Like I said, this is one of my favorite things to talk about because this actually kind of clears away some of the, the crazy cobwebs and kind of demystifies this whole federal procurement process for a lot of people. So today we have uh, some different learning objectives, some expectations. I'm going to talk briefly about those. Then we're going to get into the six steps about that I've created of how to actually submit a federal RFP. And uh, if we have time, we're going to very quickly take a quick look at a sample RFP, just so you can kind of get a look at what these solicitations look like when they come out. You know, they can be pretty intimidating. And if you are new to working in the federal sector and you've never seen one of these things before, um, you know, your, your eyes will kind of pop out of your head. Your head may spin around a few times. I've had some clients that just kind of get very overwhelmed by this. And so I always like to just kind of look at these things and break it down. So try to make it as simple and as easy as possible. So don't get too freaked out. Uh, we're going to talk about some stuff, some that might be a little technical, but uh, we'll keep it as easy as we can to understand. And um, again, don't be intimidated and just uh, know that we have a lot of great resources to help you out. So obviously we're gonna talk about the types of solicitations. You know, we have multiple ways at the federal level that we actually procure products and services. There's all kinds of different contracts. I'm gonna talk about four of the key ones today and the types of solicitations that I'm gonna review and discuss are the things that most people think about as far as like a request for proposal, a request for a quote. These are the types of solicitations you'll find on our public websites like sam.gov. So if you're looking for opportunities and you find uh, this type of work, those are the the things we're going to focus on. We're not going to talk about like GSA schedules or uh, federal supply schedules, um, GWAC contracts or different things you may have heard of. Those are a completely different animal than what we're going to talk about today. And expectations, I just want to touch on this very briefly. And any of you that have been in uh, any of the other sessions we've done with the, with the chamber, um, you know, know that uh, I, I kind of go through this and, you know, understand that contracting for most small businesses is something that you have to want to do. Um, very, very few firms just kind of fall into government contracting, although I've had a couple in my career that have gotten just extremely lucky and a contract just sort of fell out of the sky and hit them in the head. Uh, but that doesn't happen. 
That's not the norm. So you really have to want to do it. Um, and some of the reasons that people have trouble breaking into the federal market is just not understanding the requirements, not understanding you know, what it's actually going to take as far as the time and commitment. Uh, but it is definitely doable. Again, we have many quality small businesses from Western PA that do amazing work all across the country for our federal agencies. And I've mentioned a couple of them before. We have one that does work for NASA and Texas, another one that's been doing renovations in the White House, so the White House itself for a couple of years now, and I believe that contract is still ongoing. I actually haven't checked in with that client lately. Uh, but you know, we have some really amazing companies that are small businesses, two, three, four person, you know, companies that are doing just excellent, excellent work. So again, don't be intimidated and understand that it is a process, but once you kind of learn how to bid on things, it will get a lot easier to go a lot smoother for you. And of course, the expectations from the vendor, we hear these all the time. Uh, and sometimes people think it's really easy and they can just kind of show up and say, hey, you can give me a contract. Other times people come in and say, uh, you know, this is all rigged, it's all political, which absolutely is not the case. Um, you know, the truth lies though somewhere in the middle. So that's my little take on the twilight zone there, the truth zone as I like to call it. Um, you know, again, it does take time and commitment and effort, but uh, there's nothing rigged or political about it. It is a little complicated, I'll give you that one, um, but it's definitely something that we can help you work through. And expectations from the government, and I know you've heard this before from me in my other sessions, we're always looking for the same thing as any other consumer or potential customer. Quality products and services, reputable vendors delivered on time every time, competitive prices and simplicity. Uh, it really is about just meeting those five criteria to give yourself the best chance for success in the federal market. So first things first, step one always, and I lead with this quite a bit, I'm going to focus a little bit uh, differently though on this, is take an inventory of your company and you really want to make sure you build your foundation. Now, one of the things you want to be cognizant of before you actually bid on a government contract is performance history. I say this a lot, but I have it highlighted in red this time. You need to have a minimum of two years in business on the commercial sector before you jump into a federal award. Federal agencies, we are very risk adverse and we want to see companies that are solid, solvent companies that have a history of in business, performance on successful contracts before we'll give you your first award. No federal agency, we typically do not want to be anyone's first customer. So if you just started your company, you don't have that minimum two years of capacity yet, uh, you'll really want to focus more on the commercial sector sector and investing your resources in that and actually building your business so that you can actually handle some of these contracts down the road. Again, you always need the commitment for management. You're going to need to do some marketing, sales, size, of course, isn't important. Make sure, though, that you have financial resources. That's another area uh, that I like to talk about and touch on, especially if you've never bid on a federal contract before and you're in an industry where it's common to get money down or you take a deposit up front. Um, you know, we see it a lot in construction or roofing contractors and things. Government agencies do not front people money. So if you need to buy a particular piece of equipment or you know have a, have an inventory built up before you can successfully bid on a contract you're going to have to find funding from somewhere else before you can actually jump into that award and have an opportunity so we are not in the habit of fronting people money or giving them half up front now if you have some sort of long term contract you know with some multi year deal or even something a couple months long of course, you're going to be able to invoice as you go through the different phases of the contract. It's not like you have to wait till the very end to get your money. So we do do that, obviously. Uh, but when it comes to actually giving you money down so that you can go buy what you need to compete on a contract, that's not going to work for us. So if you're a manufacturer, you need to have good quality assurance plans and things like that in place. Office management is also very important once you get into actually bidding on things. If you actually, when, once you uh, win a government contract, hopefully, you could be subject to different audits. Now, I don't mean IRS audits, but actual contract audits. Our agencies, when they award contracts, they get audited all the time by other agencies that do procurement audits and things like that. You as a potential small business vendor could also be you know, subject to certain audits on different contracts. So it's important that you understand you have to keep good records. And we actually specify in the federal acquisition regulations how long you have to keep some of those records for. So for example, for certain types of contracts, you may have to keep uh, your records from that contract, all your payments and invoices and things for three years 
years, five years, uh, some of them are two years. It depends on the contract and type of award and what agency you're working with. But you need to have good, accurate files and records and good organization and office management within your business. And technology. Everything we do is pretty much electronic these days. So always, always, always make sure that you have access to uh, high speed internet, things like that if you can. I know that's a little difficult. There's a lot of areas and pockets in Western PA that don't have high speed broadband and stuff like that at this point. Um, there are some programs out there that are hopefully working on it, but you do wanna make sure that you have the best access that you can get in your area to the different technology needs that you'll need. And finally, always ID your core competencies. That's very important once you start to actually bid on federal awards um, you know sometimes companies don't want to admit they can't do something or they kind of want to be you know that that firm that does everything and we don't look at that honestly as a positive at the federal level we want experts we want mission critical and mission focused people and we would much rather you do one or two things exceptionally well and never even come close to failing on a contract we award you instead of you say telling us you do 50 different things and do all of them in a very mediocre fashion okay so don't spread yourself too thin and make sure you understand and focus what it is you're bringing to the federal government what it is we're expecting out of you and how you can show and demonstrate that value to actually win some of these awards and it's much, much easier when you focus on what you do well and stay specialized in that. And I want to add, Dave, you know, all of these things are things that your business should already be working on before you get to this point. So yes. if you know in the future that you want to do large contracts or even grow your business, I think this list is the perfect way to start building and growing and checking off those boxes. You know, even if you don't go for federal mm -hmm. contracts, like I said, just for your own growth. So actually, I'm going to be sharing... Um, I'm going to try to take some of these bullet points and share them on our page later. Yeah, absolutely, Melanie, please do. Um, you know, and you're right. Those are things that we found over the years that if people, um, you know, just really focus on those things, especially when they're first starting out, it just sets them up for so much greater success on down the road, no matter what they're doing. Like you said, whether it's government work or maybe you want to do international work and start, um, you know, exporting and things like that or looking into other areas, revenue streams, potentially other markets and having that basic business stuff out of the way will take you very far in a lot of different areas. So in addition to all the things we talked about, you always have to register in SAM, which is the system for award management, and also have your dynamic small business search profile done. We talked about those things last class, so I'm not spending any time on those today. You'll want to establish a team of key employees when you first get into your contracts and actually start to bidding, bid on things. Uh, that can be pretty critical for a lot of people. It's always good to have the different perspectives from your team, from your small business. Um, you know, And if you don't have a large staff that you can really draw expertise on and everything don't be afraid to reach out to your p tax center um, or even just friends and family and the reason you want to have these people involved um, you know just people that at least have a general idea of what you do you're going to need somebody to kind of proofread some of the rfps and your solicitation responses and things and it's always good to just have that second set of eyes and then obviously you're going to want to find contracting opportunities which we'll talk about on the next slide but you always want to be realistic um, something that sometimes really gets people caught up in, in when they're pursuing federal opportunities at first is they their eyes get bigger than their stomach and they think they can handle these big, massive five and ten million dollar contracts. But if you're a small business with two people and the largest contract you've ever done in the commercial sector is maybe one hundred thousand dollars, do you really think that you have the capacity to perform on a five million dollar federal contract? Probably not. And, um, you know, you may. And if that were something, then I don't award contracts directly anymore, but there are certain types of contracts that I do have to authorize before the contracting action can take place. Um, but you better believe that something like that comes across my desk and I'm doing a a capacity check on a small business and I see something like that, you and I are going to have the very, very detailed conversation before I authorize that agency to work with you, uh, just to make sure that you can actually perform. We don't want to set you up to fail. That is absolutely the last thing we ever want to do. So as far as finding opportunities, you want to review bid notices. Obviously, I'm a big fan of the PTAC centers. I'm sure you've heard me talk about them many, many times. I worked for a PTAC for quite some time before I came to the SBA. Uh, but they have that electronic bid matching program that is just a phenomenal search tool for federal, state, and local government notices. So instead of you bouncing around to some of those different websites there, you can work with your PTAC center, and I have their contact information again at the end, and sign up for one of their bid matching programs. 
use. And what that is, is basically it's a, an electronic online scraper where they have a database and you submit some search terms, some NAICS codes or industry specific uh, terms for the type of work you're looking for, plug that into their database and let their computer go out to all those different federal, state and local websites and find that work for you. So that way it saves you the time, it saves your staff time, you don't have to bounce around, spend hours going down all these different rabbit holes, trying to find these different sites to locate things to bid on. Their program brings all the solicitations straight to you. And always, always check out SAM.gov. Even if you do have a bid match program, make sure you sign up for a profile there. SAM.gov is not only, as we talked about last month, it's not only our registration database at the federal level, but it is where we house all of our federal opportunities valued at $25,000 and over. So if you're interested, when you want to actually start pursuing, taking a look at some of the federal opportunities, SAM.gov is where you're going to want to go. And you know what I want to add to that as well? When you're looking through all of these things, as you put these keywords into Google, a lot of other websites come up where they charge you to search for these things or they say they're going to look mm -hmm. for it for you and then at the end want to charge you money. These are government websites. They do not cost money. The resources are there for you. Make sure you're checking to see that you're at that .gov website, that you're not just clicking yes. the first Google link up at the top. It does make a big difference. So I just wanted to point that out because as I was exploring, that's something that I've run into. <laughs> absolutely. Great point, Melanie. And you're absolutely right, especially even things like the bid match program. You know, the PTACs are funded by the Defense Logistics Agency, which is a federal entity. Uh, they get some other state and local money and they give you that bid match either entirely free of charge or in some cases if they do charge it's a very small amount like maybe 25 bucks a year uh something very very cheap like that whereas if you just went to google like melanie said and signed up for a private company for their own version of the online bid matching program it could cost you five six seven thousand dollars a year um so don't pay for that you know always check and see if there's a government source that's either free or government subsidized or something else first before you go paying a bunch of money for stuff like that. So great point. All right, so now we're gonna get into the fun stuff a little bit and actually talk about some of the types of solicitations. So we actually have four formats that we'll usually use, and these are the four formats that you are going to see on SAM.com. We have requests for quotes, we have requests for proposals, invitation for bids or sealed bids which is what most people think of when they think of a government contract where you fill out some paperwork or some you know complete your bid submission seal it up and you send it into an office and then maybe there's like a public bid opening or something like that and then we have sources thought or what we call rfis which are requests for information and sources thought are a little unique in that the first three are actual offers you're making to the government when you're responding to a solicitation. A source of sought notice though is not an actual offer. So we're gonna discuss each of these in a little more detail. And a bid package, just so you understand there, the solicitation, the bid solicitation, is what the government puts out for the public or for you as a small business vendor to respond to. Your bid package, if you ever hear that phrase, a bid package is your response to the solicitation. So the package is what the bidder is putting together to respond to a proposal. So sometimes those words get a little uh, inter used a little interchangeably about solicitation, bid package, and things like that. But really, the bid package is just your response. The solicitation is the offer. So keep those in mind. That'll help you out a little bit as you get down through this. So, but first of all, the first thing I want to mention is all these fun solicitation numbers. Now, solicitation numbers, when you see these things on SAM.gov, People look at these and they're like, why on earth does the government use this crazy, you know, um, crazy filing system? Why do we have all these different codes on these things? And what on earth does any of this stuff even mean? And why do I care? Well, actually, there's very specific reasons that we have these codes. All solicitations are going to be have an alphanumeric code and it's going to be 13 digits. OK, the first six digits or so uh depending on the agency they're going to be the buying office so i made this one up obviously sba 123 is not a real office but different offices have different codes and you'll see that on the sample we'll take a look at the next two numbers that you'll see are just the fiscal year so if you see a one nine for every solicitation actually that comes out this year you'll see a two one because it's 2021 so nothing too crazy there 
the next character is called the alpha code and that one is important and i actually have a nut next uh the next slide i have some information on that and then the contract identifier is the last four digits that's just the agency's internal contract number that they use to record that solicitation so whenever you see these um you know don't get overwhelmed by these goofy numbers they do actually mean something and they are important but uh, i'd like to break that down for people because i get so many people ask me you know i don't even understand this this solicitation number changed or why did this happen and how do you even know what any of this stuff is or what it means well there you go so it's right on the slide there slide 18 of the presentation and of course melanie will be sending out the slides and everything after the fact so if you ever get stuck on a solicitation number or you wonder what on earth it means that's what it is so the next one like i said the alpha character that's an interesting one now sometimes people when they look at these don't realize that that letter actually dictates what type of solicitation you're looking at so clients will look at these sometimes and if you see an r for example in that position you know that you actually have a request for proposal if you see a b that's going to be an invitation for bid if you're going to see for example like an l that means it's a lease agreement that type of thing so that character is very important because if you have nothing else about the solicitation but you at least have a solicitation number or and you can look at that character and know what type of item it's going to be so obviously, depending on the type of bid, it's going to dictate uh, whether or not it could be something in your wheelhouse or not, in addition to what the bid is actually for. So it's important that you understand that. And all 26 letters of the alphabet are used for some of these codes. Now, some of them aren't assigned yet. Some of them are called reserved or, or things like that. But bear in mind that uh, pretty much all letters are used. And you can find the entire list of what all those fancy little codes are for those alpha characters right at the website there at the DFAR site at 204.7, and I have the link there. So if you ever want to, uh, if any of you are in sales or marketing for your company, or you're the individual that's been charged with, uh, you know, kind of figuring out what this stuff is for your business, and you want to impress your management, memorize a few of those codes, because it's pretty funny sometimes clients get a kick out of whenever they can't figure something out, and they send me a solicitation number, and I'm like, oh, it's just an invitation for bid, or it's an RFQ, and they're, you know, they have no clue how I figured that out so fast, it's because I know what that little code means in the alpha code. <laughs> so, you know, it's something, a little trick, but uh, that absolutely carries a lot of weight and that'll dictate a lot of your procurement procedures and what bar regulations will apply and everything else, which again, we'll touch on here shortly. Dave, you can't give away all your secrets. I just thought you were like a wizard or something. <laughs> no, no, some people do. It is, it is funny occasionally. But hey, I'm, I'm all about sharing information. I have no problems with that. Anybody that knows me, it does. I, I you know, keep it real with everyone as much as possible. And I'm always happy to help. And any knowledge I can pass on somebody's finds helpful, I'm very happy to share. So I vouch awesome. for but that. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> awesome. But all right. So first type of actual solicitation is a request for quote. Now, these are used by the government to obtain information and quote, quotations, typically used for standard commodity products and services. What you're going to see here with these different types of uh, procurement contracting vehicles and solicitations that we use they actually are attached to what it is that we're buying. So like commodity products and services would typically fall under a request for quote. This is an example where we'd be just looking for the most competitive price. So we're looking at competitive price, so cheap for commodity products and services. So off the shelf type items. So think about things like office furniture, pens, pencils, um, you know, maybe uh, tires, parts for vehicles, things like that, things that don't have any specialty component to them. You know, we're not asking for custom work with this type of stuff, just things you can readily buy, just like anybody else. Cleaning products, janitorial supplies, I mean, that sort of thing is what we're looking for. So those are things where you, there are examples of things you'd see for an RFQ. So we're looking for the cheapest price when the estimated value of the government's need is expected to be under $250,000. Now that $250,000 threshold is important because that is what's called our simple Simplified acquisition threshold. So all contracts valued at $250,000 or less are automatically presumed to be set aside for small businesses, which is really, really cool. So when you think about that, that kind of goes back to that slide I had a little while ago about, um, you know, sometimes people think contracting is rigged or the big companies come in and grab all the businesses, all the business. Actually, big companies and large corporations can't even apply or bid on any contract valued at $250,000 or less. So unless the contracting officer or the agency if they can't find a small business, then they can open it up for full unrestricted competition and get offers from those large corporations. But for the most part, 250K or less is going to be set aside for small businesses. So this is an area, request for quotes, where 
small businesses, the few commodities could have a lot of opportunity and you will see quite a few of these requests for quotes. So again, these quotes, now quotes can be used occasionally, you know, for things over 250,000, but for the most part, it's gonna be under that $250,000 threshold. And I'm gonna talk about the standard forms in the next little batch here, but uh, you'll usually see what's called a standard form 18 or an SF-18 on an RFQ. And keep in mind for the quote, they're just looking for price again. So always, always remember that's very price driven. Now a request for proposal, for proposal is a little different. This is where we're looking for an objective based procurement and we know exactly what we want and exactly how we want it implemented. So we're going to tell you precisely what we're looking for. We're going to say we have this project. We want the end result to be this. And here's the steps that we want you as the small business vendor who's doing this for us. Here's what we want you to do to get there. So you're going to follow our rules and regulations exactly the way that we specify in the solicitation. So you're going to respond and have to make sure that you can actually meet all the criteria that we lay out for you. So at that point, um, oh, wait a minute. I think I skipped the slide here, Melanie. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Okay. Re re le 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 real quick stop here. All right. Request for proposal. Let me go back. I was looking at the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was looking at the presenter of you, and I actually skipped it. Okay. All right. Yeah. I was talking about an invitation for bid. <laughs> so my bad. Okay. So invitation for bids. And I think that went. Oh. Okay. See okay. Sorry about that, everybody. So the, I didn't realize I had the RFP actually on the, on the screen there. And I read that and then I started saying that. I was like, wait, that's not right. Okay. So an invitation for bid, this is a sealed bid. This is when we know exactly what we want done and exactly how we're going to tell you exactly how we want you to do it. So you'll be evaluated according to the specific criteria, like I said, that we lay out for you. And this type of solicitation offer will be awarded to the lowest responsible bidder or the lowest price technically acceptable. So for this, there's not a lot of wiggle room in your offer. We're telling you and dictating to you what we want done, how you're going to do it. And we're just looking for the lowest price that will meet our specs that we dictated to you. So that's how an invitation for bid or an IFB actually works. And that's what a sealed bid is. Now, it's going to go back here now to the RFP. An RFP is a, a type of sealed bid, but the difference is with an RFP, we're just describing in general terms what it is we want and what the actual service or supply is that we need. So for this type of offer and solicitation, when it comes out, we're going to say, OK, here's what we want our end result to be. Kind of like I said, with the invitation for bid, here's the end result. But we don't know how to accomplish it. We know what we want, but we're not the industry expert that you are. So we're going to give you a general set of parameters and you tell us your best solution as a high quality small business vendor to implement our project to get us where we want to go. So that's the difference between a IFB, an invitation for bid and a request for proposal. So both of them are typically sealed, so to speak, when you submit them, meaning they're you know kept confidential until the contracting officer actually opens them. Um, the RFP, though, when it's actually time to award that, it may be subject to negotiations because obviously you can have different uh, processes at that point and potentially different uh, solutions for our problem or our project that we want completed. So there's a little more um, that goes into these on the front end before it's actually awarded. And this type of contract with an RFP is awarded on overall best value. So again, we're not looking for lowest price. We're gonna look at other performance factors in an RFP. We're gonna take a look at things like, um, you know, maybe deliverables. Do you have a better warranty than somebody? Can you do the project? Um, maybe you're charging a half a million dollars more for a project, but you can complete it six months sooner than a competitor who's $500,000 less, but it's going to take them a year to implement. You know, we'll look at other things like that to determine what provides the best overall value to the government and whatever is in our best interest is what we're going to go with. And the type of form you'll normally see with these is an SF-33 or an SF-1447. And the same for the IFB. Okay, and now I'm back on track here with the slides. Sorry about that, everybody. Like I said, I hit the wrong arrow and didn't realize what I did there. But uh, hey, look, I have a, a really quick question. <clears throat> when you're going through that list, um, you know, we know that people often talk about 
um, like the different certifications and how they give people an advantage and others a disadvantage. While we're talking about how you go through that list, can you just tell us really quickly how that works? Uh, sure. As far as the the far as the procurement program or the certification programs, mm -hmm. yes. Um, all contracting offices. Now, what people don't see is there is a lot of time, effort, and research that goes into procurements before they actually are posted on SAM.gov. And one of the things we're going to talk about here is actually right on this slide, Melanie. So this is very very timely. Is the sources sought solicitations, and this plays right into your question. As part of the market research that agencies do, they will often use sources sought notices. Now, as opposed to an RFQ or an RFP or a sealed bid where you're actually sending in a quote, all this is is the contracting officer doing market research to determine what small businesses are out there that could potentially compete on different contracts and what certifications are they bringing to the table. So they will take a look at that and based on the things like the source of side information, other research they do, the buying activity does on like dynamic small business search or SAM.gov, they will actually at that point be able to use those sole sourcing and set aside thresholds for those certification programs if they can meet what's called the rule of two. Meaning if they can find at least two quality small business vendors, they can set aside the contract so that only those two businesses can compete. So in the case of, let's say, the woman-owned program, they, uh, the, the, the buying activity puts a, and when I say that, I just mean the contracting agency or the office that's, that's procuring what they need. Um, the buying activity puts out a sources sought notice. They get uh, maybe 10 responses to a particular sources sought. They find that three of them, though, are women-owned small businesses. They meet all the criteria. They could potentially successfully do the work. That contracting agency at that time can then set that contract aside so that only those three women-owned small businesses can compete. So the other seven, even if they had a potential to you know, do a really great project, being that they don't have the benefit of that certification, they're completely exclu excluded from the opportunity to bid. So that's how the certification programs can play into that. Now, the other thing with some of the certifications, especially in the 8A program, there is the opportunity to take that a step further and actually issue sole sourcing awards. And I mentioned that during the 8A presentation, and that's where if an agency does all their due diligence and takes a look and goes out there, they can actually issue a direct contract without any competition to somebody in some of those other certification programs. So there's a little more that goes into it for that part, but typically when it comes to restricting things for set-asides and things like that, which is uh, mainly, you know, more applicable to the source of sought notices and stuff. That's how that would work. So that was actually it was a great question. Hopefully I answered that clearly. Okay, uh, contract format and standard forms. All right, so this is another thing in another area where people get really mixed up. And we actually have, though, a uniform contract format. It's again in four parts. So this is separate from the uh, the, the different um, you know uh, types of solicitations, but these actually dictate whenever we put an offer out and put a solicitation out on same.gov, this actually specifies how our offer and how our solicitation is gonna look. You'll very easily, if once you know these different sections and understand where to look for things, you'll be able to figure a lot of this stuff out and you can find the different FAR sections, FAR part 14 and uh, FAR part 15, and I have the links for those here in a couple slides, that'll explain the different contracting procedures and what a solicitation looks like. So when people first look at this, they get really confused if they first look at a solicitation. And I'll, again, I'll show you one here shortly. They first look at one, they get really overwhelmed because there's all these different parts and it doesn't make a lot of sense. They don't understand things. Most people typically want to look at uh, you know, what is actually being acquired, which would be in section B. And then they want to know the second thing they typically want to know right off the bat is found in section L, which is clear down way into the solicitation. And that's the actual construction instructions and conditions. And how do you actually respond to these things? Normally what happens is people see a solicitation and they start in part one and they'll go to section A, section B, and then right about section C or D, they lose their minds because they can't find how do they actually respond to this goofy thing. So all the sections of a contract offer are very, very important. They're very critical. You have to know them. But if you just want to be able to look at a contract offer, a solicitation offer, very, very quickly just to see if it's for you so you don't have to spend a ton of time on it, you want to look at section B, section C, and section L. 
Those are the key things that are really, you're really going to want to hone in on. B will give you what exactly being is being acquired. C will out, outline the statement of work, which is obviously very important. So it tells you, you know, what's being acquired, what's expected of you. And then L is going to tell you exactly how we want you to respond. So those are the important parts. The whole thing's important. So don't ever respond to something and say, oh, David, the SBA said I don't have to read all those other parts. No, David, the SBA is not saying that. What I'm saying is just for the sake of time. And if you're new to this and you just want to get a feel for these things, just so you don't get overwhelmed and before you actually bid to be able to see if this might be something that's in your wheelhouse, focus on those three sections to start. That'll be very, very helpful to, uh, you know, once you get a feel for it, to help you break into it, and then you can start going after some of these things. And you, you know to just kind of look at those three parts and those areas very, very quickly. And then if it's not a contract for you, you can move on to the next one and you don't have to waste any more time learning those different contract clauses and actually doing an offer. So that's a little pro tip there. Focus on those three sections. So you've seen these standard forms mentioned a few times. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on these. But again, these are very similar to the different types of solicitations I mentioned. The, the Depending on what sort of offer or solicitation we have going on is going to have a specific form attached to it. So a standard form 33, 1449, the 1447, 18 and 26 are the ones you're going to see majority of the time. And these are actually found on the GSA e-library. Um, and you can see I have a little note there. Some of them are used again only when those uh, simplified acquisition procedures of $250,000 or less are being used. Others uh, may come into play at different points, and sometimes that will actually change. So they may start an offer with one form, and it may be transitioned into another form, depending on what's actually being bought. So it can be a little confusing, but I have these all broken down on these following slides that tells you exactly when these things come into play. And again, Melanie's going to have this for you, so don't be too intimidated by this at all. But an SF-33 is used for solicitation, offer, and award, and this is what we call a bilateral document. So that means not only will you fill this form out with your offer, you sign it, send it in, the contracting officer uh, upon acceptance of, the, of it by the government, they sign it, send you a copy back, and that is the form that actually establishes your contract. It's used for sealed bids or negotiated contracts over $250,000. So if it's under $250,000, you're not going to see the SF-33, okay? It's going to be $250,000 and over. The SF 1449, again, solicitation, contract, and order form, but this is only going to be for commercial items that are estimated to have a value under the simplified acquisition threshold. So if it's $250,000 or less and you're responding to uh, an RF, uh, an invitation for bid under $250,000 or less for commercial items, you're going to have an SF 1449 attached to it. So it's pretty much it. Nothing too, too crazy. Again, it depends on what we're buying and the value is what form is attached. And all these forms, when you see them, are actually filled out very similar. Uh, they have the same types of boxes on them and everything. You'll see it in the sample that I have. Um, so again, don't be too, too turned off by the forms. The 47, that's when we're going to see negotiated contracts for supplies and services when the simplified acquisition procedures apply. That can also be substituted sometimes for the SF-26 or 33, and the award is generally made using the award portion of the 1447. So this one's a little weird because even though this document, contract document that you sign, which is your actual acceptance of your offer, has an award portion on it, sometimes contracting officers instead transition it over and will send you an SF-26 or 33 to actually sign since that is just specifically an award style document. Um, really don't know the particular reason that's done. It's just the way that some of the agencies function. And finally, up two more here, we have the standard form 18, which is the request for quotation. And again, we talked about quotes, um, typically used for simplified acquisition procedures. So under $250,000. However, it can be used for acquisitions on quotes over 250. Sometimes they will supplement the SF-26 um, or use a contract to award a contract resulting from the standard form 18. So the key thing to remember, though, on this one is request for quote is typically going to have a standard form 18 attached to it and a quote is not an official acceptance of award necessarily and what i mean is keep in mind unlike the other ones whenever you sign your name and you submit your pricing proposal and all that stuff um 
you know, the agency, when they accept it and sign off on it, that forms your contract. With a request for quote, we may ask you to give us a quotation and we might ask you how long that's good for. So if you tell us this quote that you've given us is good for 90 days, we may not sign off on it right away and actually form a contract with you until like day 89 before that 90 days hits. So once we do that, that's when you would form a contract and actually get a purchase from the federal government. So until that time, it is just considered an offer on your quote. So just keep that in mind. And then finally, the SF-26, Form 26 is just used for awards and contracts. Uh, typically, it'll be used in place of uh, the SF-18 on the request for a quote. So again, those are the forms. Don't get too overwhelmed by those. Um, we'll, we'll see one of those in the sample here very briefly. All right. So how do we actually write the proposal? Honestly, writing a proposal, it's not anything too outrageous. It's a matter of just doing your homework, making sure you understand the proposal solicitations. If you're not sure about something, you can always ask questions. When it comes to contracting performance, you can contact the contracting officer and KO or CO is typically the abbreviation for contracting officer. Um, a lot of the DOD entities though, just a little note, will use KO because to them, a CO is a commanding officer. So if you're in the military, and you use CO, they're expecting you to mean somebody above you in rank. Uh, so sometimes that's confusing and for the, uh, the military agency. So they typically stick with KO for contracting officer because a CO means something else to them. A lot of the civilian agencies, though, will just say CO, contracting officer, or what have you. Um, so if you have any contract performance questions, they will tell you, the contracting officer will, how you're able to submit your questions. Everybody has to have fair and equal opportunity to bid on these things when they're out in the open market. So you have to be, um, they have to make sure that they're giving everybody the same information. So typically they will not respond to you individually. If you ask them a question, they'll tell you to either go back and read the solicitation if it's something that you should have seen in the solicitation, or if something is missing, they'll post an amendment to the offer but they will put it out there publicly so that everybody has the same info. If you actually need help writing the proposal, though, you can definitely work with and your PTAC Center. The PTACs are very, very good at doing the proposal stuff. They will work with you and show you how to respond properly and make sure you have all the T's crossed and the I's dotted so that you're putting in a good quality offer. You always want to respond appropriately, align your proposal with the government's needs, and you want to learn how to articulate and make sure you're you know, conveying what makes you the best solution for the contract. So again, preparation is always key. You want to review the solicitation, make sure you have all the applicable schedules, clauses, attachments signed off on properly, and understand the FAR parts that are actually governing the type of solicitation you're looking for. So I have all those listed there, key FAR regulations. Those can be found very easily at acquisition.gov. I used to do a full class on how to navigate the FAR, uh, but that was up until they transitioned the website. They made it much more user-friendly, and now it's just a matter of going to the acquisition.gov site, and you can very easily browse and find those FAR sections, enter some keywords, and get the information you need. So it really doesn't warrant doing a whole class on just the FAR anymore, which is why I have the FAR parts now kind of built into some of my presentations. But again, it's just a matter of making sure you understand the solicitation, answering all the information and in in the questions, and um, you know, just following the submission requirements. At the end of the day, whenever you're actually responding to this, it comes down to doing a lot of things right. You know, there really is not a magic bullet when it comes to, to doing the work and putting in the what it's going to take to actually respond to an RFP or an RFQ or what have you. Um, it, it just comes down to do a lot of things right and making sure you follow the rules and following the directions. Those are the most critical items with a contract. You want to make sure your proposal is well-written, error-free, which again, having that other person kind of come in, proofread your work a little bit, have another set of eyes, take a look at it. Um, you know, you want to offer pricing that's fair and competitive and make sure you tailor what you're doing to the government is specific, to the government's specific needs and purpose. You know, we're very mission critical with our government contracts and our procurements at the federal level. So we want to hear how you have value. What do you do that's so much better than your competitors? Why should we give you that contract? You know, so don't get into creative writing at this point. Um, you know, that's sometimes something that people do. They 
They start off, well, I started my company because I woke up one Saturday morning and I went out on the porch and it was a nice brisk fall morning and this ray of sunshine caught me in the eye and it just made me realize that I need to go and nobody cares, okay? <laughs> so don't do that. And I've had solicitation offers when I used to award contracts that started like that. Um, you know, especially too, if I give you a page limit and I say, hey, I want this double space, 10 pages, and I need to know your company history and other things, don't give me all that fluff and kind of extra stuff uh, that really doesn't mean anything to the bid. Keep it professional, stay on point. So what to avoid? Failure to understand the appropriate solicitations and governing FAR regulations, incomplete or late submissions. Um, you know, one of the downsides when we tell you we need something by a specific time, there is no legal wiggle room for us. So even if you've had the worst day ever and we would love to help you out, if I tell you I need that bid by four o'clock and you show up at my door at 401, I cannot legally accept that bid. You know, people sometimes would get really upset because you may have put in a tremendous amount of time and effort on a solicitation but if you didn't have it to me on time and you know you had all these terrible things happen to you in a particular day which i, I again i'm not not a monster i totally understand but if i didn't have it by that time i could not take it that would actually blow up our entire bid process it would be considered an unfair advantage and we'd have to start at the beginning and do the whole thing over again so it's always very very important that you understand you know when we're asking for things and we're telling you how to do things there's a reason for it and a lot of it is because of federal procurement law so we don't have the ability to just make allowances and exceptions and kind of let things slide all right so understand that but you always just want to make sure that you um, understand again your best value evaluation components, you know, what is it that we, we're going to tell you typically in the solicitation, how we're going to evaluate everyone. Everybody's going to know that up front. So you're going to want to pay attention to that specifically. Errors in the submission, you know, if you have a little typo or two, fine. But I had a, had a gentleman one time who used to send me bids all the time and different letters would be missing out of the solicitation. And I actually ran out of him, ran into him one time. I mean, like the word and wouldn't have a D on it or any word that should have had a K in it. There was no K. And, um, Ran into him one time, couldn't figure out what was going on and talked to him about it. He's like, oh, yeah, my keyboard broke. It's missing a couple letters. So don't do stuff like that. You know, do not send in repeated offers with missing letters from a keyboard. You know, type, get, get a new keyboard. <laughs> let's be sensible and be good professional business people. Um, you know, let's do stuff like that. And the biggest reason that most people never bid or don't win a successful contract is they simply don't follow the directions. Again, if I tell you exactly how to submit something to me and you decide, oh, I don't like that way, I'm going to do it my way because that's what you're used to doing, you are going to be deemed non-responsive and you're just not going to get the contract. So no matter how good a job you did with it, even if it was the best offer by a mile, if you didn't follow my four format then you weren't eligible for the opportunity okay contract pricing and i say a few words about this then we'll take a quick look at the sample and wrap it up here so contract pricing is something i don't get into a lot these days um due to the nature of what i do with having some of that approval authority i mentioned um you know, it's just not something I can advise clients on in a very, uh, very deeply, but I will talk about it in a public setting. But uh, so uh, we'll, we'll discuss it a little bit here. So contract pricing is very important. You always want to make sure that you're developing a, um, you know, responsive proposal with a good quality price, that it's reasonable and competitive, but also profitable for you. You know, we don't want anybody to lose their shirt or to go under from not being able to perform on a government contract. At the same time, if you say you can do something for a really, really cheap price and you're going to lose money, but that price you submitted to us when the government does its independent government estimate before it even puts the bid out, if that price you submitted to us is within our tolerances for what we think we can get that contract done for and we have the research to back it up, and we award you that contract, you're gonna be on the hook for that price. And I've had clients sometimes think, well, I'll just come in with this really low price on this contract, give them a real sweetheart deal, start building my capacity, and then on the next contract, I'll jack the price way up and, and you know I'll make up the difference. And that is not a good strategy for developing pricing for government contracting. There's no guarantee that you're ever gonna win that second or third contract that you think, or be able to pad the price enough on that next contract to make up what you lost and you're in business to be a successful small business so you want it to be profitable for you if you can't compete on price and the contract you happen to be looking at is very price driven and you've done some past research and realize hey it just isn't a good fit for you then move on to the next contract 
Okay. I'm not a big fan of clients doing that. I've had a few in my career that have said, you know what, I'm going to take a loss on this contract and hopefully it'll help me. Um, you know, sometimes it works. I've had maybe two or three people that it was something viable for them, but uh, that is not the norm. And you really have to be comfortable with it and know what you're doing. And you better have the resources to take that kind of hit if you're going to do that. So again, I'm not a fan of it, but this is your company. You do things as you see fit and do what's best for you. And again, your contract pricing, um, depending on whether or not you have a negotiated or sealed bid, that could have some influence on as to whether or not how you price. I'm always a big fan, though, of having clients go and look up some of that past procurement history. Again, the PTAC centers are very, very good about doing that for you. And also, depending on what you're looking at, you want to check out the FAR parts because they'll give you some nice little information in the FAR sections that deal with the types of contracts. So again, FAR Part 15 for negotiated contracts, FAR Part 14 for sealed bid contracts and FAR Part 13, the simplified acquisition procedures. And those can all be found at the acquisition.gov site I had a few slides ago. And this is just a real common formula. If you're really new to this and you have no idea where to start to price your products or services, um, just keep these in mind. Typically for products and, and um, commodities, you're looking at your material costs along with your labor costs, your overhead and your profit. That's going to be what your price is when you add all those up. For services, your hourly overhead expense plus your hourly wage plus your profit. So those are two very common ways to do it. You may have little nuances, but for the most part, that is a way to just kind of get yourself started. And again, don't hesitate to uh, work with your PTAC. And my uh, pricing here, just best value. I mentioned these earlier, best value, lowest price technically acceptable. I just kind of have those in there so people have uh, you know access to that information and kind of how it allows flexibility for like the best value procurement, best lowest price. And important pricing considerations, just kind of recap that. Learn from the past contract history, consider all costs and special requirements if there are any, factor in best value, include your bidding costs if it makes sense, and make sure you allow for overhead and profit. And what I mean on the include your bidding costs is you know, don't go overboard or suddenly put in so much cost just to do the bid that it makes your price so high that you have no shot at it. All right, and finally, submitting the offer. Once you're satisfied with your proposal, including your pricing, submit your offer exactly as stated in the contract, in the solicitation, like I said. Sit back, relax, and hope for the best. If the contracting officer comes back to you, if it is an opportunity, if there is an opportunity for negotiations, you want to make sure you're responsive. Ask them, um, you know, give them what clarifications they need. If you don't win the award for almost all types of government contracts, but for certain ones, you can request a debriefing. Take advantage of those if you have the opportunity. The briefings on federal contracts are excellent because they tell you exactly where your bid was deficient. So if you submitted an offer, it didn't go your way, you can get a look at that and figure out where you were, you know, where you went wrong, why didn't you get it, and then that could help you improve your offers down the road. If you it. Great. And finally, if you win it, awesome. You did some great work. Congratulations. Now you get to pull the contract. And keep in mind, and this is very, very important. I always want people to remember this. Only a warranted contracting officer has the authority to issue modifications to your contract. And what I mean there is once you sign on the dotted line and your contract offer is accepted, you're only on the hook for exactly what is in that contract. And sometimes when you're working on at a facility site where this contracting action was done, you know, somewhere else, let's just say Washington, DC for the sake of sake of argument. So the contracting officer is uh, is responsible for procuring services for a facility here in Pittsburgh, I'll just say. So the contracting officer in D.C. did the negotiation, word, all that stuff. You got the contract. You're here performing at the facility in Pittsburgh. Somebody at the local facility says to you, you run into an issue, or even if you don't, says, oh, hey, I see you're doing that this way. Um, you know, the project manager, well, I wanted it like this, but blah, 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 blah. What would it take for you to change that? You say, oh, yeah, you know, you want to be a good vendor. So you're like, yeah, I can do that, uh, but it's going to cost another 50k but i can implement it the way you want it and the guys like or the ladies just like oh yeah go ahead and do it that way that's what i prefer if you do not clear that with the contracting officer first the contracting officer does not have to pay for it do not change bid specs without contracting officer approval i don't care if that person starts pitching a fit yelling and screaming at you saying hey you know i want it this way the contracting officer didn't do it right you calmly tell them let me check with the contracting officer make sure that's an authorized expense get the change order the modification then you proceed with the contract 
And always make sure your staff is aware of that too. The contracting officer is the only person that is allowed to expend additional federal money or change the terms of your contract. I cannot stress that enough. I've had clients take you know, a couple hundred, three hundred thousand dollar baths on federal contracts because they did not realize that somebody who told them or asked them to make a change did not have the authority to do so. So always, 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 I'm very cognizant of making sure people realize that. So final thoughts, always keep your SAM, Dynamic Small Business Search, and your socioeconomic certifications up to date. Find and study RFPs, samples, other solicitations, but don't rely on templates. Each contracting action that you respond to could be very different, even if it's for the same product or service. Um, you know, so there could be a different set of requirements, different things that different agencies are looking at. So always make sure you treat it as an individual item. Um, you know, chart your competitive position and framework. You want to identify your customers, marketing. I have a great marketing presentation that I just did yesterday. I'd be happy to come back. I know I talked to Melanie about it. We'll be doing marketing at some point uh, in the future here. And um, you know, make sure you understand again what your competitive advantage is and that the contract you're going for is actually something you can do. That's very, very critical. So very quickly here, I know I'm uh, coming up on time, but I just want to show this real quick. And Melanie, does that look good? You should be uh, seeing a PDF. Yes, but I'm going to make it full screen so we can just see it a little bit better. Okay. Yep, that'd be great. Go for it. Um, so yeah, hopefully it's not too small and I promise to try to scroll slow. I don't want to get anybody sick here or anything, but this is an example of what you will see with an RFP. So you can see right off the bat here, it says it's a negotiated RFP in box four. We have the solicitation requirement number. So we can see 2021 there, uh, our request for proposal. And then down here, they have all the different contents or along the left-hand side. So when you go to SAM.gov, this is exactly the type of document that you will download from the SAM.gov website that will show you exactly what you're doing. So if you're looking at A there, this is going to be the SF33 down in the right corner. You can see that standard form 33. Uh, so if you go to B, just click on that a little bit here. It starts showing the different supplies and the ranges of what they're looking for. This particular contract is for uh, tungsten carbide components for uh, ammunition. And this is actually a pretty technical contract, which is why I kind of just wanted to show people what this would look like, because normally most of you aren't going to be in such a specialized area. So this is a, a pretty high end, high level one that most people are never going to see something quite this in depth or detail. But you can see right here, if you go to C, description, specifications, it gives you your work statement. They tell you exactly what drawings to use, how they want the parts manufactured, machine, all that type of stuff. Delivery requirements are there. But then down here on section L, what did we say section L was? That's your instructions. This is something that, again, a lot of people, they'll look at something and they'll look at a bid and they'll go to A, B, and maybe C, and then they get really frustrated because they can't figure out what they actually have to do with it. Section L is where you will find that. So it normally will give you a little bit more basic information, but then if you keep scrolling down here, it will find you will find the piece where they tell you exactly how they want you to submit. So see proposal submission, you'll find that, and this tells you what exactly they're looking for. So they tell you how long they want it to be valid for. They'll tell you if they have any special requirements, the different format of the proposal so they want you to have a technical factor with a maximum of 50 pages past performance no maximum pricing i mentioned those margins they're telling you top left bottom you know header footer width they want it on eight by eleven eight and a half by eleven paper all that stuff so we are telling you exactly what to do so i just wanted everybody to see that you know, most solicitations or RFPs that you see aren't going to be this detailed. But uh, again, this one's a little more specialized, but I like showing the harder one because then it only gets easier from there. So that's what it actually looks like. So now that you know those sections, though, you can very easily kind of scroll through when you download these things and get a feel for what kind of item you're actually potentially working with there. And as always, here's my resource slide. We'll make sure you have this. Uh, we have some other sessions coming up here. This is uh, the 2021-2022 calendar. So we'll be doing federal certifications next week. Or Marissa Fentel, I should say, my coworker will be. Uh, registering in SAM coming around again. Our e-chat schedule and all that will be attached in the PowerPoint. 
And of course, if you want to keep in touch with us at the district office, you can always sign up for our Gov deliveries at wpainfo at sba.gov is our general mailbox. And then there is my contact info as well as Marissa. And Marissa and I are the business and opportunity specialist for the Western PA office. So I think we are about right on time here. So I will go ahead and uh, stop my screen share and take any questions. I know Melanie, um, let me see if I can find you here. Hi. No, you know what? You did such a good job. We didn't have any questions come in, but I would love okay. to encourage everyone to continue to put questions in the comments. If you're watching this right now, we can always circle back. Um, and if you haven't registered for our emails on our website, I'll give that in a minute. You will be getting the slides as long as you're registered. But Dave, really quick, I just want to thank you for joining us. As always, this is really invaluable information for our businesses and especially those little tips that people would not be able to find out on their own until they've lost money and time sure. and things like that. So we really appreciate you and we look forward to having you next time. All right. Well, thank you so much, Melanie. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, definitely reach out and I'm uh, always happy to, to help out with that stuff. I mean, believe me, I've been doing this stuff a long time. I did not learn it overnight. It took me quite a bit of years and everything of awarding contracts, negotiating things, you know, administering different things. So yeah, I've been in the same position. I've competed on things. I understand out there very well and everybody's going through. So any knowledge I have, I'm always happy to pass it on. So yeah, I look forward to the next session. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Talk to you soon. And thank you all for joining the Latino Pittsburgh Digital Speaker Series. It is an initiative of the Pittsburgh Metropolitan Area Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Its goals are to share relevant information, inspire growth, and foster opportunity. Speakers and workshops include community leaders and members, as well as other individuals and programs that have a positive impact on not only the Hispanic community, but the Pittsburgh region at large. If you would like to become a speaker or learn more about the chamber, please visit www.pmahcc.org. Thanks. See you next week and have a great day.